just talk to the agency. Don't just go with official information. Network with people. Find other people and find out what they're doing. Do that online, do that face to face. Join local disability specific organisations that are relevant to you. So if you've got a child with a brain injury, join the Friends of Brain Injured Children. Whatever it is, make connections with other people so that you can hear their stories and you can support each other through the changes ahead. Speaking of language, I'm going to use participant or person with disability and family quite interchangeably in my conversation with you today, mostly because I realise that there are people who will be participants and there are family members in the room. And when I'm using them interchangeably, it, interchangeably, it doesn't mean I'm talking about one or the other, just understand I'm talking about both. And when I use the word agency, I'm talking about the National Disability Insurance Agency. So that's the, the, the body of people whose job it is to deliver the National Disability Insurance Scheme. All right, so the first hurdle, if you like, in the NDIS is about eligibility. Some conditions are automatically eligible for the NDIS and they're listed in some of those resources you'll find on their website. So that might be a good place to start, finding out whether or not the condition of the person with disability is or isn't automatically eligible. But families are saying that even if you have a condition which is automatically eligible, it's really useful to actually also talk about, at this point, the other conditions that a person is living with, because then all of those things should be taken into account in the planning process. So even if you're automatically eligible, it's still worth going through the process of describing the other impairments that a person's living with. So eligibility is assessed on a degree of functional impairment and exactly what the thresholds are for that is still being worked out and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a little while. It is deficit focused, unfortunately. It's all about what you can't do. It's not about what you can do. And as much as we'd like it to be about what you can do, we have to accept that there are some stages in this process that are going to be about the deficits and not the assets of a person. You are going to need to give evidence of a disability. That evidence might be in the form of a diagnosis, a written diagnosis from a specialist. So if you've got those, if they're gathering dust in a cupboard because they happened some time ago, you need to dig them out and dust them off and be ready to provide copies of those along with your application. Specialist reports really help. We've learned that already. So if you don't have a specialist report that's recent or that covers the diagnosis in a way that it's going to need to, you might need to get one. There is some advice for medical practitioners on the NDIS website. Could be useful to print that off and take it with you when you go to see that specialist so that they and you can talk about what it is that they need to say in that report in order for it to be most helpful in this process. Before you go to a specialist appointment, make sure you think about the things you need them to say, the range of limitations that a person's diagnosis has on their life, so that they can talk about that in their report. Professionals have to write any report themselves, so you can't write it and give it to them and have them sign it. As much as professionals and specialists might appreciate that because it makes things very efficient for them, at the other end of the process, the agency is not going to accept something that wasn't written by the specialist themselves. So just be mindful of that. If you need them, the NDIS may actually fund specialist reports. So it doesn't hurt to ask. We actually have concerns about the way the eligibility process is running right now because what they're doing is that they're assessing each diagnosis or each condition that a person has separately and based on the assessment of that one condition, deciding whether that condition is eligible or not eligible. They're not actually looking at the whole person. And we think that that's actually something of a mistake because we all know that one condition affects another condition and the combination of those might have an impact or an impairment on the functioning in your life that individually those conditions might not have to the same extent. It's something that we hope will change over time. It might take some review processes and appeal processes for that to happen. So just be mindful that at the moment, when they do the assessment, they'll assess each condition one by one. All right. 
You need to understand the scope of the NDIS. It's not going to be the be all and end all of everything for every person. So the NDIS assumes capacity. And what that means is it looks at what support do you need in order to get to achieve the thing that, that you would use with that capacity. The NDIS won't fund things that ordinary families already have to fund, things like rent or health insurance. But they will fund the additional cost that you might face because a disability is present. So if your swimming lessons costs more because of the additional support a person needs because they've got a disability, they should fund that gap. The NDIS also won't fund things that are properly the responsibility of another sector. And this has already been tested in the appeals process and I'll talk a little bit more about that later on as well. So keep these broad framework things in mind as you're going through the process in terms of being realistic about what it is that they're likely to do or not do for you. It's important to understand the process so that the anxiety that you feel about it is reduced, but also so your expectations are real. You also need to understand the promise which COAG made, and I'm sure you will have all heard of this, it was in the media for quite a while, that no one will be worse off under the NDIS. That doesn't mean that you'll have exactly the same services that you have now. There will be changes. You might stop getting something that you're getting now and start getting something different instead. The idea is, however, that overall you shouldn't be worse off. From what we're hearing, most plans, most people who already have plans are saying their plans are better than what they had before. But you do have to go through the process as it's described. So you need to accept the process rather than fight against it. They've got a plan, they've got an approach, they know how they're going to go through this. We have to walk that journey that they've prescribed for us and come out the other end with what we want. So get that list of things that they will and won't fund. The item, no, the item numbers on that list are what's going to appear in your plan and it'll really help you to talk their language. So when we think about planning, it's a bit like baking a cake, really. If we start baking a cake and we don't have all our ingredients lined up, if we start baking a cake and discover we've got no eggs, chances are the cake's not going to turn out really well. So approach your NDIS planning in the same way you'll approach preparing to bake a cake or any other activity that you do that involves preparation. Preparation, basically, is key to this process. So talk to everybody that's involved in the participant's life like right now. What do they know about the person? What do they know about what works and what doesn't work? And what can they add in terms of dreams and hopes and goals for the person? Think about who you want to have help you prepare for your NDIS planning. Having a service provider help you to prepare, that's one option. But just remember that they will plan from a service provider perspective. That's going to be their focus, potentially leaving some of the other parts of life um, as a little footnote instead of being core to what it is that you're planning for. But it is very useful to talk to them, get their input, particularly the workers that are working directly with your, with your family member because they know them really well. Having listed all the things that you've got now, think about what's working and what's not working. List everything, not just the services that you can see, but also the things that are happening behind the scenes. So you possibly don't know how many hours of case management you're getting because you don't, you're not there when the case manager is making the calls, having the conversations, doing the background work that happens before they come and see you. So find out about all those unseen activities that are going on as well. Think also about the support that you're getting from family and friends however big or small that might be, and in whatever shape and for whatever things that they're doing, not just disability related. So think about things also like, does the person have a financial manager? Have they already got a bank account? What are all the different things that they might need? Think about the whole of life, not just the service aspects. Do your research, go to the expos, check out the equipment, have a look, hear what other people are saying about the equipment, and then know what it is that you're going to want to argue for in terms of how that particular piece of equipment is going to improve your quality of life. 
find a buddy, connect with other families. No one needs to be isolated going through this process. There's plenty of support and plenty of other people out there, so make those connections and use them. We are concerned that we've heard from New South Wales that quite a spike in guardianship applications has been going on, where service providers have been putting in applications for guardianship for isolated people who have been in their care. We're very concerned about that because there is nothing in the NDIS legislation which says a person needs to have a guardian. So don't feel that as you're approaching this, there's any obligation on you to get a guardianship order or any of those things. There are processes within the NDIS rules about nominees, but you don't have to be a guardian for those things to be in place. So let's not take away people's rights for decision making if we don't have to. Planning is going to involve meetings. When the preparations are done, the meetings begin. So ideally, these meetings are going to include the participant to the, to the greatest extent possible. It really is important that the person with disability has input into this process, regardless of their age or regardless of the kind of disability that they have. Take someone along with you. Make it a familiar person if you can. Someone that you can debrief with afterwards. Someone that can step in if you start to get flustered. Make sure when you first meet them that you talk to your planners, find out a little bit about them. What's their experience with the particular disability of your family member? See if you can't work with a planner that has experience with the kind of disability that you're dealing with in your family. If after the first meeting or two, you feel like you're not connecting with the planner, the planner's not understanding the things that you need, you have every right to ask for a different planner. Use that right if you're not happy with the person that you're working with. Expect to have several meetings. This isn't necessarily a quick process. Each meeting might take several hours, so pace yourself. Expect to get draft plans in between those meetings and have the chance to have a look at those before you meet to talk about them again. At some point in one of those meetings, they're going to use something called a special needs assessment tool. It's a secret tool. The planners are going to want to work through that with you and it is a deficit model again. So this is the time when you're going to have to talk up the worst day, the worst aspect of your disability, the most difficult things that you deal with. Because unfortunately, as part of this process, again, they're going to look to, to focus on that. Don't accept things in your plan that you're not happy with. And once again, make sure you have these conversations documented. People have been talking about how valuable advocacy is in this process. So the New South Wales Council on Intellectual Disability held a, a conference just in August this year. And the quotes that are on the screen, and I haven't seen them written big, so I have no idea whether you can actually read them or not, are talking about how valuable advocacy has been to the people. Um, as they've been going through the process, particularly for people with intellectual disability who are socially isolated, who don't have strong family members like yourselves to speak up for them. It's really important that they have access to independent advocacy. I've also heard that people are really focusing on wanting that advocacy to be independent and not funded by the National Disability Insurance Agency. We need to recognise that plan nominees, plan managers, support coordinators, all of these people's roles are funded by the agency and that means they can't be fully independent. So if you do need to use an advocate, do think about how independent you want them to be. <coughs> there are two advocacy organisations in the ACT, ourselves and Advocacy for Inclusion. We have got limited capacity, but we certainly will help if we possibly can. So don't be afraid to call us. Okay, this is a really big part of the planning process, talking about goals. And this is the time to think about not just the practical things, but also the, the dreams. Maybe that person who uses a wheelchair really wants the chance of swimming in the sea. Maybe the person who's confined to their home really wants a chance to work or study. Whatever those dreams are, include them in this process. Think about your short-term goals and your long-term goals. 
and recognise that these are the goals for the person with disability primarily, rather than the goals for the carers, although they can be there to an extent. Think about big picture goals across a whole series of domains. So what's your goal for education? What's your goal for employment? Do you have a financial goal? What goals do you have about how independent you want to be? What are your social goals? What are the leisure goals that you have? And what are your community access goals? Think about all of those and write them down. One person said, try to have a strong idea of what is actually needed and then ask for a little more just in case it has to be cut. It's not bad advice. So let's look at the parts of the plan then. It starts with the goals. These are going to be big picture, they're going to be vague, they're going to be fairly generic. Then we get objectives and there might be one or two or more of these for each of the goals that you've got. They're going to be a bit more specific. The strategy is the actual what we do. That's the bit where it says we provide 10 hours of this or 12 hours of that. And then they're going to want to write down a measure. How do we know that the 10 hours of this or the 12 hours of that actually achieved the objective that we set it out to achieve? And all of those elements are going to be in your plan. So one of our clients, for instance, currently lives in a supported living setting and she wants to live independently. She wants to move out. So her objective, or one of her objectives, might be to learn more about what she'd need to have in place in order to move out. The strategy in the first year might be that she wants to work with a case coordinator or a housing coordinator so that they can do the research and make a bit of a plan in order to move towards living independently. And the measures might be about what did they learn? Did they make a plan? Has the things that have gone in that plan actually happened? Have the things? And can that plan inform the next NDIS plan that the person's going to make? So it really is goal directed. The goal might be to reduce social isolation and anxiety when accessing the community. And the strategy might be that you're going to have a one-on-one -on -one support worker to take you places. That you're going to have some life skills coaching from someone and you need a bit of transport to get where you're going because right now the public transport's scary. The goal might be to be an active member of community. So what's needed here might be some group support. It might be some transport again. It might be someone to work with the person to explore what their interests are so that they can connect with local groups that have common interest. If you're already doing things that you really want to keep, then you might have to work backwards. So if you already go to a craft group and you love it and you want to keep going to that craft group, the objective might be that you're meeting new people and getting out of the house. And the, the goal might be that you're building confidence and reducing isolation. So if you've got things, you can work backwards, but otherwise start with the goal and work down. Think about the different things in your plan in these three ways. Talking about the core parts of the plan, the capital parts of the plan, and the capacity parts of the plan. Now this is pretty new language. And not all the planners might even be using this yet, but I think it's the way it's going. Because remember that you're going to go through this process annually, and that means parts of your plan are going to change every year. The core parts of the plan are things like the personal care that you need, and they might not change very much, or if you've got a degenerative condition, they might increase as your condition declines. The capacity parts of the plan are the capacity building activities that you do. And these are likely to change quite a lot as you build skill, as you build confidence, as you learn new things. And the capital parts of the plan, that's about equipment. And you're not going to need a new wheelchair every year. So those will come and go out of your plan depending on your needs. So remember that the dollar amount in the plan is going to change year by year and that's completely okay because it's about whether or not your needs are being met, not what the bottom line figure is. Let's talk about respite. So you've all heard that they're not liking to use the term respite because they want it to be termed in about the person with disability 
rather than primarily about the family members. So your goals here or your objectives here might be about de developing independent living skills. They might be about being exposed to a wider range of experiences. They might be about learning to rely on other people as carers rather than the parents who won't be around forever. They might be about giving your natural supports, that's the family members, a break. And they might be about making sure that mum and dad can spend a bit more time with the other kids in the family. And that also is a relevant objective for your plans. So those are the kinds of ways you might like to talk about respite. The NDIS pretty much is about growth and development. It's about getting the most out of life. And I worry sometimes that that gets lost in the minutia of how many hours of personal care or how expensive a piece of equipment is. So it's really important that you include things in your plan which are new, things which are going to stretch you. Be bold, be brave in what you want in your life. Ask for more than just the mere existence which is what we've been used to getting for a really long time for people with disability. You deserve more than that. It's okay to ask for more. So build in things in your plan that are about learning new skills, that are about giving you greater independence. Build in things like supported decision making if you're a person who people don't believe can make any decisions. You can also ask for things that build the capacity of carers. So you could ask for a line about parent training and that might cover a whole range of things like group work that you might go to, counselling sessions if you need them, one-on-one -on -one support if there are things going on. Try to build on these parts of your plan every year. Don't expect them to stay the same. Really look to slowly grow capacity. Make a difference to the way a person is part of our community and the things that they're doing. So you've finally got a draft plan. It's got all those things in it. Does it include everything that you expected? Remember, the plan is going to be in bureaucratic speak. It's going to have an item number, a description of the item, the same as that item uh, list that you've already looked at. It's going to have a number of hours and a number of dollars for each item. So now you might need to do a bit of work with a big bit of paper and map out what that actually looks like for a week or for a month. We've seen a little bit of variability around how community activities are, are dealt with in plans. In some plans, a person's community activity goes on for 52 weeks of the year. But in other plans, they're not allowing the community activity to happen while the person is in a centre-based care environment because they're assuming that that centre-based care environment is going to pay for any community activities the person does. So there's a little bit of anomaly there right now that we've noticed. So be alert to things like that when you're looking at your draft plan. When the plan is for a person who's got quite a severe disability, the first plan is often looking very much like exactly what they've got right now. It's a bit of a business as usual plan. And I really encourage you, if you're working with a person who's in that case, to include even just one thing that is new and different. And that one thing might be, let's appoint a case manager for this person, someone who can get to know them really well over the next 12 months and then can inform what new things might go in the plan next year. Be willing, give yourself permission to take this process slowly. The NDIA has got a timetable and they really want to meet it. But frankly, that's their problem. That's not your problem. So if you want to go slow, tell them you need some more time. The NDIA is starting to recognise that they're going to need to support people to move through this transition. That we can't go from a service model that looks like this to a service model that looks like that without perhaps making a few steps along the way. So I am hearing that there's, there are some plans that are looking a bit like transition plans as they move towards the new way of doing things. So that gives us a bit more uh, confidence in the process, if you like. But a lot of people are saying that the process hasn't been nearly as scary or nearly as stressful as they thought it might be. That message about taking your time goes for implementation of your plans as well. You can take time around doing parts of that too. 
So there we go, we've been through the planning process, a plan's happened. Now the plan gets approved by the agency. It doesn't actually get approved by you because that's what the legislation says. Okay. So you could ask in the planning process and say, I really want to see a final version of the plan before you approve it. Will you agree to do that for me? And they might do that for you, but they don't have to do that because in their legislation it says that the agency approves the plan. They can't approve a plan if the question of self-management versus NDIA management hasn't been resolved. So what this is about is whether you hold the funds for your package and you pay the providers or they hold the, the funds for the package and pay the providers for you. If that question has, hasn't been answered, they can't approve a plan. So if you're concerned, a strategy might be to delay deciding whether you're going to self-manage or not until other parts of the plan are sorted out. In thinking about self-management, make sure that you understand what's required of you if you choose to self-manage. This could be part of a long-term goal of moving towards independence by starting to self-manage just one small part of the plan and building that up year by year until you're at the point at which you're comfortable. <coughs> Self-management does give you more flexibility in what you can do under your plan and who you work with, but it also comes with responsibility. Responsibility about managing that money well and acquitting it. You can get support to self-manage as well as an additional item in the plan. So it doesn't have to be, if I self-manage, do I have to use up 15% of that total in order to self-manage? You can actually get the extra money for support to self-manage. Depending on the size of the plan, it will be approved either directly by the planner you've been working with, if it's quite a small plan, or by someone more senior in the organisation. And then there's going to be a plan handover meeting before the plan is implemented. You can expect that they're going to come back and ask to review that plan 12 months from when the plan is implemented. But if you've got any changes or any problems with the plan, you can ask for a review at any time. If you don't get everything that you want in your first plan, take what you've got and then start working on those other things one by one. Pick your battles rather than waging a war. It's less exhausting apart from anything else. So let's talk about implementing your plan. Do you like that service provider with a barcode on his head? Remember that the planners at the ACT office of the agency are also the supporters and that they can help you with implementing the plan. So if you're having trouble finding a service provider, if you're having trouble understanding what's going on, they have a role to help you with that. Shop around, be picky, have high expectations, ask hard questions. Find out what other people think of the service provider you're thinking of. Find out what they will offer and what they won't offer. You get to be a consumer instead of a grateful service recipient. Use the power that comes with being a consumer. You'll be asked to sign a service agreement with each service provider that you're working with. The NDIS has a template service agreement on their website, might be a good place to start. Service providers are also developing their own service agreements. But don't assume that just because they've presented you with a service agreement, you have to sign that and you have no say in what's in that agreement. Look at the detail, ask the hard questions and get things changed that you don't like. So be careful about this process and consult with other people if you're not sure about what all the things in the service agreement are about. This is a trial and the agency is calling itself a learning organisation. And they're really trying to actually be that, at least, you know, in some spaces. So do give feedback about your experience of the agency and your experience of the scheme. There's a feedback process that you can use on their website. They're going to send out participant surveys. Don't we all love filling out surveys? There is one of those things. Have your say. Let them know both the good and the bad and the ugly of your experience. So those are the formal feedback mechanisms, but there's also a whole bunch of informal ones. So on Facebook, for those of you who are Facebook users, there's a group called NDIS Grassroots. It has thousands of members. 
Many of those members are family members like you or people like, with disability like you. And they're asking questions of each other. They're sharing their experiences. It's a useful place to go and learn. Be aware if you go and join that group that the agency and others are also members of that group and they're watching what's being said. So just be a little careful of the language that you use. Disability people organisations like Epilepsy or any of those also put out newsletters and they're often talking about the agency and people's experience of the NDAs as well. So they're another good source of both opportunities to give feedback but also to learn more. And of course, there's always the media who love stories about the NDIS at the moment. Out of interest, in the Barwon region, since they opened in July 2013, they've received 99 compliments, 138 complaints, 83 requests for plan or internal reviews, 10 external appeals to the AAT, and we'll talk about those in a moment, two referrals to the Ombudsman, and one Australian Human Rights Commission complaints. So that's one launch site and that's their data on feedback that they've got. Are you telling me I have to hurry up? Yeah, okay, I've got to move faster. All right, so complaints, reviews and appeals. If you're not happy with the way you're being treated by the agency, you can complain. You can complain about anything that they're doing. You can complain to them or you can complain to the Ombudsman. If you're not happy with a decision, of the agency, then you can ask for an internal review. And if you're still not happy after that internal review, you can ask for an appeal to the Administrative Appeals Tribunal, which is an external review. Are you confused yet? Yeah. So, the word review is used in lots and lots of contexts. When they talk about review, they might be talking about a plan correction. They might be talking about a plan amendment. They might be talking about a plan update. They might be talking about a decision review. All of those things are being called review. It's really confusing. So every time somebody says the word review to you, ask them which sort they're talking about. If you need to use any of those processes, really encourage you to give us a call. ADICAS has been uh, selected as the External Merits Review Support Organisation in Canberra, which means we have somebody who can support anybody going through the external review process, the appeals process, but we can also have a conversation with you about those earlier steps. Uh, that, that staff member is also available to do education and information sessions or have those conversations with individuals. So if you're a member of a group and want to find out more, please give us a call and she should be able to come out and help. So the AAT, the Administrative Appeals Tribunal, has had a bunch of referrals, but only four actual published decisions right now. And they're relating to what the limitations are, what the definition of substantially reduced capacity is. They're relating to what's reasonable and necessary for a, a service provider to do, for a family member to do, or for which system should be involved in uh, providing a certain sort of care. But they've also conciliated and mediated a whole number of other of these. And so we don't know what's in all of those conciliation and mediation outcomes, but we know that the person was satisfied enough with what they were offered by the agency in order to stop the appeal process. So that means these processes are actually changing what the agencies are doing. There are other ways to get change. Some people have been writing directly to David Bowen as the CEO, or to Bruce Bonnyhady as the chairman and telling them of their experience. And sometimes that's creating change. There was a lady in South Australia who recently got changed by putting up a petition, petition on change.org. She got 40,000 signatures and she's now getting the nursing support in her home that she needs. So there's lots of different ways that you can achieve change with the NDIS, not just those formal processes. And I'm going to leave it there with a special thank you to the people who shared their stories with me and who, who let me learn from their experience of the NDIS. Thanks very much, everyone.